Meditations on First Philosophy by René Descartes Translation, John Weish First Meditation Of the Things of Which We May Doubt Several years have now elapsed since I first became aware that I had accepted, even from my youth, many false opinions for true, and that consequently what I afterward based on such principles was highly doubtful. And from that time, I was convinced of the necessity of undertaking once in my life to rid myself of all the opinions I had adopted, and of commencing anew the work of building from the foundation, if I desired to establish a firm and abiding superstructure in the sciences. But as this enterprise appeared to me to be one of great magnitude, I waited until I had attained an age so mature as to leave me no hope that at any stage of life more advanced I should be better able to execute my design. On this account, I have delayed so long that I should henceforth consider I was doing wrong were I still to consume in deliberation any of the time that now remains for action. Today, then, since I have opportunely freed my mind from all cares, and am happily disturbed by no passions, and since I am in the secure possession of leisure in a peaceable retirement, I will at length apply myself earnestly and freely to the general overthrow of all my former opinions. But to this end, it will not be necessary for me to show that the whole of these are false, a point perhaps which I shall never reach. But as even now my reason convinces me that I ought not the less carefully to withhold belief from what is not entirely certain and indubitable than from what is manifestly false, it will be sufficient to justify the rejection of the whole if I shall find in each some ground for doubt. Nor for this purpose will it be necessary even to deal with each belief individually, which would be truly an endless labor, but as the removal from below of the foundation necessarily involves the downfall of the whole edifice, I will at once approach the criticism of the principles on which all my former beliefs rested. All that I have up to this moment, accepted as possessed of the highest truth and certainty, I received either from or through the senses. I observed, however, that these sometimes misled us. And it is the part of prudence not to place absolute confidence in that by which we have even once been deceived. But, it may be said, perhaps, that although the senses occasionally mislead us respecting minute objects, and such as are so far removed from us as to be beyond the reach of close observation, there are yet many other of their informations or presentations, of the truth which it is manifestly impossible to doubt. As, for example, that I am in this place, seated by the fire, clothed in a winter dressing gown, that I hold in my hands this piece of paper, with other intimations of the same nature. But how could I deny that I possess these hands and this body, and, withal, escape being classed with persons in a state of insanity, whose brains are so disordered and clouded by dark bilious vapors as to cause them, pertinaciously, to assert that they are monarchs when they are in the greatest poverty, or clothed in gold and purple when destitute of any covering, or that their head is made of clay, their body of glass, or that they are gourds. I should certainly be not less insane than they, were I to regulate my procedure according to examples so extravagant. Though this be true, I must nevertheless here consider that I am a man, and that consequently I am in the habit of sleeping, and representing to myself in dreams those same things, or even sometimes others less probable, which the insane think are presented to them in their waking moments. How often have I dreamt that I was in these familiar circumstances, that I was dressed and occupied this place by the fire, when I was lying undressed in bed. At the present moment, however, I certainly look upon this paper with eyes wide awake. The head which I now move is not asleep. 
I extend this hand consciously and with express purpose, and I perceive it. The occurrences in sleep are not so distinct as all this. But I cannot forget that at other times I have been deceived in sleep by similar illusions, and, attentively considering those cases, I perceive so clearly that there exist no certain marks by which the state of waking can ever be distinguished from sleep, that I feel greatly astonished. And in amazement I almost persuade myself that I am now dreaming. Let us suppose, then, that we are dreaming, and that all these particulars, namely the opening of the eyes, the motion of the head, the forth putting of the hands, are merely illusions, and even that we really possess neither an entire body nor hands such as we see. Nevertheless, it must be admitted at least that the objects which appear to us in sleep are, as it were, painted representations which could not have been formed unless in the likeness of realities, and, therefore, that those general objects at all events, namely eyes, a head, hands, and an entire body, are not simply imaginary, but really existent. For in truth, painters themselves, even when they study to represent sirens and satyrs by forms the most fantastic and extraordinary, cannot bestow upon them natures absolutely new, but can only make a certain medley of the members of different animals, or if they chance to imagine something so novel that nothing at all similar has ever been seen before, and such as is, therefore, purely fictitious and absolutely false, it is at least certain that the colors of which this is composed are real. And on the same principle, although these general objects, namely a body, eyes, a head, hands, and the like, be imaginary, we are nevertheless absolutely necessitated to admit the reality at least of some other objects still more simple and universal than these, of which, just as of certain real colors, all those images of things, whether true and real, or false and fantastic, that are found in our consciousness, are formed. To this class of objects seem to belong corporeal nature in general, and its extension, the figure of extended things, their quantity or magnitude, and their number, as also the place in and the time during which they exist, and other things of the same sort. We will not, therefore, perhaps reason illegitimately if we conclude from this that physics, astronomy, medicine, and all the other sciences that have for their end the consideration of composite objects are indeed of a doubtful character, but that arithmetic, geometry, and the other sciences of the same class, which regard merely the simplest and most general objects, and scarcely inquire whether or not these are really existent, contain somewhat that is certain and indubitable. For whether I am awake or dreaming, it remains true that two and three make five, and that a square has but four sides. Nor does it seem possible that truths so apparent can ever fall under a suspicion of falsity or incertitude. Nevertheless, the belief that there is a God who is all-powerful and who created me such as I am, has for a long time obtained steady possession of my mind. How, then, do I know that he has not arranged that there should be neither earth nor sky nor any extended thing, nor figure, nor magnitude, nor place? Providing, at the same time, however, for the rise in me of the perceptions of all these objects, and the persuasion that these do not exist otherwise than as I perceive them, and further, as I sometimes think that others are in error respecting matters of which they believe themselves to possess a perfect knowledge, how do I know that I am not also deceived each time I add together two and three, or number the sides of a square, or form some judgment still more simple, if more simple indeed can be imagined? But perhaps deity has not been willing that I should be thus deceived, for he is said to be supremely good. 
If, however, it were repugnant to the goodness of deity to have created me subject to constant deception, it would seem likewise to be contrary to his goodness to allow me to be occasionally deceived, and yet it is clear that this is permitted. Some indeed might perhaps be found who would be disposed rather to deny the existence of a being so powerful than to believe that there is nothing certain. But let us for the present refrain from opposing this opinion, and grant that all which is here said of a deity is fabulous. Nevertheless, in whatever way it be supposed that I reach the state in which I exist, whether by fate or chance, or by an endless series of antecedents and consequence, or by any other means, it is clear, since to be deceived and to err is a certain defect, that the probability of my being so imperfect as to be the constant victim of deception will be increased exactly in proportion as the power possessed by the cause to which they assign my origin is lessened. To these reasonings I have assuredly nothing to reply, but am constrained at last to avow that there is nothing of all that I formerly believed to be true of which it is impossible to doubt, and that, not through thoughtlessness or levity, but from cogent and maturely considered reasons, so that henceforth, if I desire to discover anything certain, I ought not the less carefully to refrain from assenting to those same opinions than to what might be shown to be manifestly false. But it is not sufficient to have made these observations. Care must be taken likewise to keep them in remembrance. For those old and customary opinions perpetually recur, long and familiar usage, giving them the right of occupying my mind, even almost against my will, and subduing my belief. Nor will I lose the habit of deferring to them and confiding in them so long as I shall consider them to be what in truth they are, namely, opinions to some extent doubtful, as I have already shown, but still highly probable and such as it is much more reasonable to believe than deny. It is for this reason I am persuaded that I shall not be doing wrong if, taking an opposite judgment of deliberate design, I become my own deceiver, by supposing, for a time, that all those opinions are entirely false and imaginary, until at length, having thus balanced my old by my new prejudices, my judgment shall no longer be turned aside by perverted usage from the path that may conduct to the perception of truth. For I am assured that, meanwhile, there will arise neither peril nor error from this course, and that I cannot, for the present, yield too much to distrust, since the end I now seek is not action, but knowledge. I will suppose, then, not that deity, who is sovereignly good and the fountain of truth, but that some malignant demon, who is at once exceedingly potent and deceitful, has employed all his artifice to deceive me. I will suppose that the sky, the air, the earth, colors, figures, sounds, and all external things are nothing better than the illusions of dreams by means of which this being has laid snares for my credulity. I will consider myself as without hands, eyes, flesh, blood, or any of the senses, and as falsely believing that I am possessed of these. I will continue resolutely fixed in this belief, and if indeed by this means it be not in my power to arrive at the knowledge of truth, I shall at least do what is in my power, namely, suspend my judgment, and guard with settled purpose against giving my assent to what is false, and being imposed upon by this deceiver, whatever be his power and artifice. But this undertaking is arduous, and a certain indolence insensibly leads me back to my ordinary course of life. And just as the captive who, perchance, was enjoying in his dreams an imaginary liberty, 
when he begins to suspect that it is but a vision, dreads awakening, and conspires with the agreeable illusions that the deception may be prolonged, so I, of my own accord, fall back into the train of my former beliefs, and fear to arouse myself from my slumber, lest the time of laborious wakefulness that would succeed this quiet rest, in place of bringing any light of day, should prove inadequate to dispel the darkness that will arise from the difficulties that have now been raised. End First Meditation